Hello, boys and ghouls. Welcome to episode 43 of Dads from the Crypt, a Tales from the Crypt podcast. My name is Jason. I'm joined by Jody. Hello. And Mondo. Hello. My boys have come back to roost. <laughs> We're all here. We're all it's here. I missed it, guys. No, yeah, I know. Um, no guests tonight. We're kind of uh, bringing it back to roots, which is kind of fun. Hey, 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 Jason, can you give us a an acapella version right now of Thin Lizzie's The Boys Are Back in Town? No. <laughs> okay. I cannot. I, tr- I try. Um, yeah, uh, we're recording this on May 15th, so it's the weekend before our William Sadler live Q&A, so hoping everyone had a great time, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in um if it doesn't happen or went terribly future mondo can edit this out and and if you did not tune in shame on you really like that's (laughs) that's on you as a human being and you have to live with that for the rest of your life you may go from that one you have made jason (laughs) just think if you didn't tune in you made jason sad Mm. he's not sad just disappointed (laughs) in true in true dad fashion he's not mad he's just disappointed and uh, go to your room and think about what you did. In true parenting uh, fashion, my daughter said I ruined her life a couple times tonight. Okay, uh, details. Um, <laughs> we have a rule that she's not allowed to go to the regular YouTube app. She has to go through the kids' YouTube. Sure. Yeah, for reasons. Um, I caught her on the uh, regular YouTube app, so I told her mm. I'm going to delete the app. Uh, what was she watching? I don't know. She watches like these like amateur teen drama things like it's just a bunch of friends like <laughs> you, you start off um, an amateur teen and that could have gone a really bad no, direction no, <laughs> no, 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 no. no 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 it's like Look, not a sh- it's not like a produced show it's like these clips that these kids well, like teenagers put together and there's just like all really dramatic scenarios and then it's not good yeah, he- hearing her. you describe that though i get to watch the like very small children's version of youtube and that's nonsense just complete <laughs> nonsense <laughs> i posted a couple of pictures a couple of weeks ago of somebody dancing around like with little poops dancing around them and like <laughs> about a potty and then the next video was little droplets of pee dancing around them and talking oh, about okay. like i don't even know uh, uh, speaking of kid stuff and, and, and jason I, I can edit this out if, if you don't want to talk to talk about this but uh, you posted on slack recently that you're going over some books that talk about sexual education with your young children mm-hmm. and you mentioned what your when, when your children now refers to a vagina as do you want to say what that is here on the air <laughs> Okay, if I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to back up a second. So my daughter is you know almost eight years old, and I think especially when you're a twin, there's kind of a mystique around the fact that your birth was different than other kids' birth. Well, well, well I th- in general, I think kids have questions at those ages, right? And, and I think I think you know just uh, to preface, I think you're doing the right thing by giving proper age appropriate good education about yeah, it yeah. right so, well that's what i'm getting to so like she, she's already been curious about you know how where babies come from and everything for oh, quite a while now and i think now that she's like you know have, has her click of friends and everything they're talking about stuff like that and she's been saying some really random stuff that she hears so we're like okay i think this is the point where the parent us as parents need to step in and kind of educate in the appropriate manner um, before she like gets all these crazy ideas in the head anyway so we got this very inclusive book it talks about you know um it, it doesn't just talk about uh i'm like I'm, I'm not gonna get all the wording correctly but it includes things like um uh, surrogacy and um other and adoption so it's not just about you know yeah yeah, yeah um anyways but there is but there are parts where it shows you know uh pictures of what sex is so at first she's like are they cuddling and you're like yeah they're cuddling so now every time me and my wife are just like sitting together like my daughter's like are you guys cuddling <laughs> like well we're cuddling but we're not gonna do that anyways <laughs> i mean not maybe those... maybe maybe later <laughs> like not with not when you're awake um but anyway so she's looking at the picture she's trying to understand the um mechanics of it and she's like oh is the vagina the penis holder 
I'm like, <laughs> you could call it that. I wouldn't. <laughs> but um, that's I, one I, way to think of it. Uh, so um, just for, for any listeners out there that may be kind of going through the same thing, um, what, what book is it? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. If, if you don't remember, I think it might be worth worth linking just because I know it, it's a topic, right, that all of us as parents have to go through. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, mm-hmm. um, I, I will say the thought of my near 20-year-old walking in on me and my wife having sex is way more terrifying than the thought of a six or seven year old right. walking into the same thing. Cause at least then I can just say I'm hurting her. Um, but with this, <laughs> with this 20 year old, they know what's happening. You're, you're, you're practicing jujitsu. Uh, yeah, exactly. We're practicing, we're practicing jujitsu. We just uh, uh, no gi. Cause I'm not going to have my gi on, but you know, uh, I'm, 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 I, I'm just kidding. I kind of thought that you would wear gi, Mondo. Uh, first of all, it, we're dude, don't kink shame me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I spend uh you know i spend jujitsu rolling around with sweaty other uh some we have some females mainly males i don't want any of those visions in my head while i'm trying to <laughs> trying to do my thing <laughs> Th- those two worlds stay very separate even like and this may sound dumb but um even when my wife was thinking about getting into it i was like well you got to find a different gym you can't come to my gym <laughs> like why not and i just said what's going to happen is someone's going to get rough with you and i'm gonna have to go fuck them up like as, as long as they're have to specify as long as they're a lower belt. Cause like if a black belt rough set up, that's just, that's his life. Like that's just, <laughs> yeah, that just, that happened. Gotta sorry. Happen. Sorry about your bad luck. Um, but uh, if a white belt did it, you know, they're going to have to learn uh, what a purple belt is really fast. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> that's funny. but yeah, those, um, those, those two worlds are yeah, really keep those, those separate. Also uh, we had the end of year picnic at my kid's school and my daughter has a quote unquote boyfriend. And uh, I finally got to meet the young man today um, and his parents. <laughs> and I'm like, do you know Nora calls you her boyfriend? He's like, no. <laughs> I think it's, it's a little <laughs> one-sided. And, and inside, Jason's like, ah, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to a different school next year. So, wow. Oh, no. Well, it's a bummer for her, man. Like, She'll get over it. Yeah, yeah, it's just either. <laughs> it's like how you know, cut and dried. She'll get over. It. She'll be fine. You know what, what's funny is like uh, my daughter really didn't have a, a boyfriend at that young age, but um, in elementary school she always had her friend Jonah. Mm-hmm. And Jonah, we always talked to Jonah's grandma. And we would go, you know, we all went to the same elementary school, went to go pick our kids up, and Jonah's grandma would usually come pick him up. And uh, I always kind of wonder like what happened to Jonah because they went to different schools and, and broke apart in middle school. But then my brain always goes like, what if he tried to be a drug dealer? Like, what if he's like in juvie right now? Right. <laughs> and then, but then I'm laughing. I get kind of sad. Like, damn, I wish I kind of knew what happened to Jonah. But A, I don't know his last name. And B, even if I did, that'd be some really weird internet searching to try to find like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't, I'd be on a list somewhere if I look for that kid. So, uh, but Jonah, if you're out there and you're listening to dads from the crypt, A, uh, why? And, uh, and B, I hope you're doing well, man. Uh, Jody, do you have your kids have any uh, crushes? Uh, no, not that I've seen yet. I mean, even though they're at that age where it could be a possibility, they've kind of been taking it a little slower, which is cool. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I appreciate that we hadn't been doing the whole uh, eight-year-old thing. So, Well, also you're uh, homeschooling. So there's yeah, we options. homeschool. So, you know, most of the kids that they see, you know, like they do, they do a lot of social stuff, but then like karate, they're kicking each other. So they now, both of my girls who are, uh, 12 and 10 now have had little boys who have been like really following them around <laughs> and bringing them little presents and things like that and they I, i've they have done a good job of being firm but nice of being like hey you know what i want to be your friend but that's all like go ahead and get that idea out of your head I'm a 10. I don't really want to do all that. So I'm, I appreciate that. I'm glad. For That's, that. Cool. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. They, they, they treat their potential suitors the way that Hank Hill treats well done steak eaters. Mm-hmm. They ask them firmly, <laughs> but politely to stay away. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, yeah. the boys got to get used to the friend zone early. So That's right. That's right. Yeah. But like, uh, it's a know, lesson. Yeah, it, the whole the whole friend zone thing is a whole nether issue because yeah. like I'm not it, that. yeah no I, I can get into it because if you think you're being friend zone you probably suck like, <laughs> like <laughs> and, and, and what I mean and what I mean is like I remember I, I was watching something recently where there you know it was some comment talking about ah oh, 
guys and girls can't be friends. I'm like, no, they 100% can. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think they can, then you should go talk to somebody about that because you got some issues. <laughs> well, and I think if you are at the place that you're like sitting around complaining about being in the friend zone, maybe you are not good at being friends to someone of the opposite gender. Like That's a great point. When yeah. I was in high school, I had a friend who about once a year or so I would ask out. Like she was just my friend. I'd ask her out. She politely turned me down every time and I'd be like, okay, cool. And then we'd just go back to being friends. And that was it. Like that was the whole thing start to finish. I never sat around whining and like, oh, I just can't get out of the friend zone. Like, no, we were just friends. I made, I shot my shot. It didn't work. Move on. <laughs> so what it sounds like is you guys met and became friends first. Yeah. Yeah. And every and, now and then you'd start developing some feelings and you, you know, see it, if they had them. Yeah. They didn't move on. If you befriend someone and you're a friend to them with the sole intention of eventually trying to hook up with them, right. you have done all the wrong things. That's correct. And you're not a good friend. You're a terrible friend and you so guys shouldn't be friends either. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 that whole thing where people who claim like I'm the nice guy. Well, if you have to say you're the nice guy, you're probably not. The <laughs> probably you're probably not, not yeah. the nice guy. And you know what? Just it's OK. Reevaluate things. Talk to someone. Get better. It's OK. Get better. better. I mean, yeah, if you're not okay being someone's friend, then you definitely should not be in a relationship with them. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Man, all that went on right. for a long time. I know. Wow. <laughs> hey. we, we had had a chance just to... We're getting know. all deep. Know, so we, haven't had, we haven't had time to process um, Jordy's <laughs> power going out that one time. Yeah, we've had all kinds of things. Power outages, medication changes, you know, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> um hey well, right. but 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 that's because we take mental health here like legit seriously and yeah, uh definitely. and we're all we're, we're all uh we're all um uh advocates for for mental health so um everyone else everyone should be advocates for mental health just go get your fucking head checked it's okay yeah i hope i'm not speaking out of turn but you know every one of us at one point or another has been on some kind of medication so yes yes <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, okay. Oh, and shout out to any uh, past therapist that might be listening to the my show. Yeah. I uh, mentioned to them. <laughs> this, um, is, this is what your therapy resulted in. This, yes, right exactly. here, this conversation. They're just they're just sitting there taking notes. Like, ooh, that's a that's a red flag. <laughs> former, former. <laughs> I gotta make a phone call. <laughs> okay. Um, again, we already talked about the Q and A. Um, hope it went great. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, Monster Palooza is the first weekend of June. I'll be there on Sunday if you want to come say hi. Um, but tonight we will be discussing the Seance, which premiered on July fourth, nineteen ninety two. Jody, give us a plot synopsis. All right. I know Mondo is glad I'm back just for this section, if nothing else. <laughs> hey, uh, to be fair, um, the first synopsis I did was dog shit. I think the last two were pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I, I just try to fit in as many inappropriate innuendos as possible and, and, and fitting with my uh, with my character over here. <laughs> the Mondo character. Uh, that sounds so gross. Oh, and not, and not to, to change subjects, but I did a training class for my work last week. And there's a guy in my class named Armando, which is my, uh, my, my, my birth given name. It is really weird to have to call someone by your own name. I've never had to, I'm sure you guys have probably dealt with this. I've never had to deal with this really in my adult life. And it was really weird. I just kept saying you or him or you, that guy, because I was like, I just don't like saying my name out loud. And uh, towards another person, I don't know. It was weird. I mean, Friday the 13th, just a couple of days ago, and everyone was talking about they're leaving me out milk and cookies. It was great. <laughs> I, I, I just imagine Jason sneaking house to house with a plastic with the mask, uh, on. With a mask <laughs> on and a machete. <laughs> and, being very, and being very disappointed and then wondering why people were, no, just, just don't, no, it's, it's my holiday. It's okay. <laughs> it's cool. Respect, respect my, my people. <laughs> All right, uh, so we start with the Crypt Keeper investigation. So we've got a whole like detective agency set up and he's talking like Humphrey Bogart, film noir detective. And uh, then we meet a medium and she talks in this German accent. We don't know who she is yet, but are, are you all fans of Blazing Saddles? Oh, hell yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, she sounds like Lily von Stump when she's using her German <laughs> accent. It's really okay. a bad German accent. The whole time, the whole time she was talking in that, I'm like, oh, it's Madeline Kahn. Uh, but anyway, so she's talking in this German accent. A man with a hooded robe walks out and just kind of stands there for a minute, and she jumps out, jumps up, and yells at him for not saying his line. So we find out these these people are con men. They're getting to swindle some lady. We don't know the details yet. 
he's uncomfortable with the plan uh but then the lady comes in and calls for her and she shuts the guy up in a wardrobe so that he can come do his part and then there's a kind of this crash inside the wardrobe but he says he's okay but right here at the very beginning i thought his voice sounded a little bit different we'll get into that later uh she lets this couple in and starts the seance and then in his other voice he says that poor woman how did i ever get into this mess so we get a flashback to one week earlier and we find out these two are benny and allison which is really funny because my friend Allison has a cat named Benny. Mm -hmm. I just assume they're up to cons now. And if you guys didn't know, Benny loves you. He does. All right. Allison and Benny, they used to be an item, but now they pretty much hate each other. Uh, they're in a lawyer's office. And that's when the Dean from animal house comes in uh, his name. And this is Prescott Chalmers, 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 that. Chalmers. Chalmers as in superintendent Chalmers. Um, uh, Benny says that he's the executor of his uncle Albert's estate. And his uncle was a bank robber who went to jail. And Allison is claiming to be that uncle's daughter. And there's a will under an investment account worth $3 million. And, but that money was the money that he stole from the bank. And uh, it, anytime I hear a con in a movie, like it always sounds so convoluted. Like we got the cousins and the uncles and, and whatever. Anyway, the, the whole point of it is they're trying to get money out of this dude. We'll, um, we'll get to it. I thought this was actually a pretty well thought out con, but it, it's not a bad one. It's just every, every time, like, when if I was wanting to con somebody and I'm like, okay, so first we pretend to be his uncle, like, I'm already like too deep here. And <laughs> I, I don't know how I'm going to get out. I don't have a good plan. <laughs> Con, con, conning people takes work. I, I, I'd imagine us three, like if we were trying to make a con, we'd be like in office, uh, an office space, like sitting around a table yeah. trying to fit. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, the problem is the money is the stolen money. And so Benny leaves the room so they can talk. A press card says he doesn't believe any of it. And she agrees with him. And uh, the scene's very flirty for supposed cousins because this is supposed to be his mom's brother, so these are first cousins, and this isn't even set in Arkansas uh, <laughs> or Alabama. I'm, I'm from Tennessee. We we talk about Arkansas and Alabama because we have to have someone to look down on too. The rest of the world can look down on us. We have to look down on someone. Uh, so well, where does where does West Virginia? Uh, uh, I don't know. We're at least equal, maybe maybe higher. I don't I don't know where the ranking falls. <laughs> And no Later offense on, to any of our fans. Well, no offense to any of our fans in Arkansas, <laughs> Alabama, oh, it, or West yeah. Virginia. <laughs> no, 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 no. And I, I say this every time that we're traveling. We're going on vacation soon, and we'll be driving through Alabama the entire time. You could not tell the difference between Alabama and Tennessee when you're in them, but we just like to look down on somebody because <laughs> they have to. And I'm sure Alabama goes. We're not like those idiots in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. So anyway, in the next scene, we're in a hotel room, and Allison is getting ready for her cousin's arrival by putting on a sexy dress and Benny is getting ready to take blackmail pictures. So they got the whole thing. This is their backup plan. If their other con doesn't work, they're going to blackmail him. And he hides in the closet. Prescott arrives and immediately removes his wedding ring. So everybody knows what's going on. They dance and she tells Prescott that the lawyer was telling the truth. And they come up with this plan to buy the lawyer out. Uh, they're going to give him $300,000 and then they'll collect their money. So that's the con. They get $300,000 from him. And she kisses him and they start having sex on the couch while Benny takes pictures. Back in the lawyer's office, Prescott and Allison come in and they give Benny a suitcase full of $300,000 to buy him out. Uh, he goes to get the documents and he starts to sing the song that was playing in the room where Allison and Prescott were together the night before, which is just the stupidest thing to do. Uh, Prescott is suspicious and realizes immediately that he's been had. Then he shows him the pictures, but then Prescott kind of laughs and says, my wife will never see these pictures. And he leaves. Allison follows him yelling his name. And then she pulls a gun on him right when he's about to get on the elevator. Vinny stops her from shooting him. But then for some reason, the elevator is not there. and Prescott steps into an el empty elevator shaft. I have no idea why this happened, but there was no elevator. The doors were open, falls down. And he's still alive at the bottom of this elevator shaft. And it's got to be, you know, multiple stories. Like you, you don't see the aftermath, but you see that it's a long way down. And uh, Benny wants to go help him. 
but he and Allison get into a fight and then they see the elevator coming down and it comes down and you hear like a crunch and then Benny calls it back up and hanging mm-hmm. from the bottom of the elevator or like his organs, like his intestines are draped. It's really great. <laughs> it's, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great gore scene. And it's a, it's a tad bit unexpected because yeah. the first part of the episode is played so straight. Yeah, right. no, it just comes out of nowhere. And I, but, I love it though. It just, I, just goes nuts all of a sudden. What I was really hoping would happen was that the um, suitcase with all the money would be stuck to the bomb elevator. <laughs> and then when it fly open, all the money would just go like spurling everywhere. <laughs> like bloody, like and, and blood and guts and stuff would just be like falling off the bomb elevator. That would have been amazing. Have you ever been in an elevator at a hotel and it's got a, um, a notice saying like elevator certification inspection available at request? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so one time i was checking i check into a lot of hotels guy travels one time i asked him i said like do you guys actually have that document for request and he goes Whoop, and just whipped it right up he goes dude you'd be surprised how many people come in here drunk and they come up they demand to see that <laughs> <laughs> wow. i was like no i wouldn't be surprised i just always just i i just, I just always wondered and the guy was just being super nice we're just chatting up having a good time talking while he's checking me in i was like this seems like the right time to ask this question i've always wondered like how accessible is that certificate Apparently, very, very accessible. <laughs> <laughs> so later on, we're at the police station where Benny like insisted that they go to give a statement about this guy falling down the elevator shaft. They didn't necessarily, I mean, really, they didn't do anything wrong other than the con itself. They didn't kill him. He just fell in this elevator shaft. And uh, while they're there, though, they see his widow, Dorothy, and she has the suitcase. And Allison wants to still get the money. And so they go over and talk to her and try to give her his cane. And then they find out she's blind. So the whole, my wife will never see these pictures. That's the whole thing. Uh, She wants to be able to fulfill all of his obligations. So he talked about them and the whole thing with the will and everything. And she's going to fulfill it all, but she needs to make sure to talk with him first. She has a spirit, an appointment with her spiritual advisor, madam leona who is a medium who can conjure up his spirit so they can have a conversation so benny and allison tie up madam leona so that allison can imitate her and she says you don't know the powers you're dealing with but they knock her out and that's when we flash back to where we started this episode Uh, and the seance is going on real fast can we say before they knocked her out she tells her don't worry we're just gonna keep you quiet i'm not gonna hurt her and then proceeds to hit her in the back of the head with a statue or something like that yeah (laughs) we're not gonna hurt her but we're just gonna give her a major concussion that could possibly change her life (laughs) don't we won't kill you we're just gonna make your whole life more difficult don't worry about it yeah so anyway um they are in the uh, seance and Allison's saying all of the words pretending to be Madame Leona and the hooded figure comes walking down the hall and again just stands there and doesn't say anything and uh, so Allison says what about the money Mr. Chalmers what do you want Dorothy to do with it and he just kind of like <laughs>, laughs and he says I want to give you the money personally and he puts the suitcase on the table and opens it up and Benny's head is inside. So that's that's that scene from earlier. Uh, and he pulls back the hood and it's Prescott. His face is all sliced up. And he just plunges his hand into Allison's chest and rips her heart out, Indiana Jones style. And uh, he ends the episode by saying, Benny was right. You ain't got no heart. Which was a pretty cool ending. <laughs> or or, uh, or or Kano style from Mortal Kombat. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. it. Right, right, right. All so, right, yeah. Mondo. Thank you, thank you, Jody. Mondo, what do you think of this episode? Uh, Jody, I'm very happy you're back, sir. Thanks for having <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks, laughs> yeah. um, me. I, I absolutely love this episode. I, I like how they play it straight for so many parts and kind of the horrific gore and the and the uh, the, the whatever, the, uh, the supernatural stuff is kind of just pasted into it. And, and I don't mean in a bad way because there are movies, like I'll use some of the later Hellraiser installments as a great example of movies that were not meant to be horror movies. And then they pasted these horror elements in to make it horror. This is obviously written um, to be a, a, you know, a a horror, a horror episode. Uh, I love the acting. This was fantastic. I love all the, all the characters in it. And again, I would say that Benny has a smidge of conscious, but, but he's also, there also is something to be said about like, yeah, you can have the conscious, but if you still go along with a plan, you're just as bad. Uh, maybe not just as bad, but you're still a bad guy. 
And, and I think they try to make you feel that little bit of sympathy for him when he tries to, you know, uh, when he tries to save uh, Mr. Chalmers life. But you also realize he still kind of let it happen. And he still went along with the scam in the grand scheme of things. And if he wasn't along for the ride, uh, none of this would have happened. Um, I also uh, love John Vernon. That I, he, I love at the very end when he's, when he's under the hood, he's talking and he has a, such a great voice mm-hmm. and you hear his voice. And I was like, oh, yeah, uh, we're about to get in some, about to get into some shit right now. Um, so I think this hits like all those really, really great pieces of uh, Tales from the Crypt where you have the, the, the antagonist. Get, excuse me. Uh, the antagonists get what they deserve. Uh, the really, really fun, the fun gore gags, the heart, man, the heart was great. And, and again, an episode I didn't quite remember from remember seeing until the heart came out. I was like, Oh, I remember watching this as a kid. And, uh, and it was also kind of cool, cool to see John Vernon in a non, um, uh, antagonist role. Really. He's, uh, he's the good guy in this really. Cause he's doesn't go along with our scheme. Oh. He goes, no, we're not going to scam. Well, you're right. He's not really a good guy. You're, you're right. His, <laughs> his, his, his wife is actually the, the protagonist in this. There's a protagonist. Um, but he didn't have that traditional, like, I guess maybe he did. I don't know. Um, I, I still remember. Also, because he was agreeing to go along with the scam because the black because yeah. of the blackmail. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and the blackmail happened because he was kind of a scum. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I was wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, well, well, uh, well what, what am I? What are my first memories of John Vernon? I was telling Jason before the show started uh, was from Ernest Goes to Camp. Oh yeah. He, he plays the land developer trying to overtake um, uh, the the camp. And there's a scene where Ernest goes to confront him and he tries to shoot him, but his gun won't work. And, and, the, and the, you, you see the, uh, the Native Americans reciting the Native American thing saying, if you're brave, the arrow won't pierce you. And I remember as a kid that I, that scene like kind of blew my mind because <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a kid's movie and he's really going to, he had the gun loaded and everything and point at him and tries to shoot him. I was like, oh shit, he's trying to kill <laughs> Ernest. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, John Vernon is a classic, uh, a classic bad guy, but um uh, yeah, a definite big fan of this episode. And I, I know we kind of talked about season three being the sweet spot, but aside from one episode, season four has been started out pretty solid. All right. Jody, what'd you think? Yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with this. I, I love a good con episode of mm-hmm. anything. Like anytime there's a con plot and like I said, it's, it's a little convoluted and you know, there, there are points that uh, I, I kind of wonder how they were going to pull all this off. Like, where did they get a lawyer's office with a name on it? I, okay, whatever. I, you don't have to have all this stuff explained to me. But then it goes from like this detective con thing into some just really over the top supernatural stuff. You got some gore, you got the, the ridiculousness of the elevator fall and the squishing. And like, it, it's just a lot of fun. Um, and uh, like Mondo, you know, John Vernon in there, that's fantastic. For whatever reason, I completely forgot he was in Ernest Goes to Camp until just now. And now I'm just having flashbacks to that movie and remembering <laughs> that, yes, he really was. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I would agree with everything everyone said. This was a really fun episode. Um, just It was just told the whole film noir, femme fatale, all those strips. Mm-hmm being kind of played perfectly um kathy moriarty just kills her role just she's so good in this she's very great at it great at it and plays a kind of like that cold-hearted just uh, mm-hmm. ag- aggressive like a femme fatale fucking nails it mm-hmm. um and i so she was in the her one of her first roles was raging bull in which she got nominated for an oscar um she was in kindergarten cop casper analyze this and analyze that <laughs> Um, she's had a hell of a career um she's also in um uh but i'm a cheerleader which is one of the uh yeah yeah, which in you know in 99 that was a really controversial film when it came out Mm -hmm. because of the uh uh the the lgbtq connotations which weren't really out in the open there now um have you guys seen the sting uh it sounds familiar but i can't redford and uh, paul newman yeah yeah it's kind of like the sting but condensed into like 20 minutes and, oh, and yeah i'm sure if this was like an hour or something like a full length th- there would be like some plot points that would be kind of sticky or like the, it might slow down but i think because it's so short and every scene just moves everything forward oh um, yeah no when, when I, it works when so well when, when i say that you know if if you really get into it some parts of it don't make a lot of sense 
That's fine though, because in a Tales from the Crypt episode, I don't need that because we're mm-hmm. we're moving it along. We're yeah. keeping things going. Like if you took too much time to explain, like, oh well, first we're gonna rent this building. I don't, I don't care. Yeah, like, it, I don't care. If the goal is to be a two-hour, like really, really, you know, whatever, gritty film noir, yeah, yeah. I want that in a 25 minutes Tales from the Crypt episode where Just I want keep it moving. Keep I want something fun, exactly. keep it going. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is directed by Gary Fletter. Um, he did Kiss the Girls, Runaway Juries, and a bunch of TV shows. Um, again, Benjamin was played by Ben Cross. He was in Chariots of Fire. It was in the 90s version of the Dark Shadow show. Hmm. Um, he was in Exorcist The Beginning, which Mondo is directed by Rennie Harlan. <laughs> oh, Rennie Harlan. What did Rennie, what did Rennie do? Why does that name sound so oh, familiar? Did he do um he was in that random street guy. Like, yeah, before. that's that's right. That's right. Um, who did the other Exorcist movie? We're talking about Exorcist, the newer ones that came out in the early 2000s. There's only one. I thought the beginning was the no, only well, one. There was the beginning and then the Dominion was the other. So basically they tried oh, yeah. was it, like half of it. Wasn't the... Dom- yeah, yeah, okay. But that was Paul Schrader who did that. So like, yeah, they filmed like half of it and they decided to redo most of it. Um, regardless. Um, do, do, do. unfortunately, Ben Cross passed away relatively recently. He was also in Star Trek from 2009, he was Spock's father. Uh, but yeah, John Vernon to me, he'll always be uh, the dean from Animal House. That's yeah, just like 100% is iconic in my head. But he what he did the voice for Iron Man in the 1966 cartoon series. And that, like, and I guess there's a bunch of like uh, Marvel cartoons um, shows that were going on around that he's, time. He's also Shao Kahn. In the Mortal Kombat cartoon series too, yeah, like the, the ones he's got the a great 90s. voice. Yeah, great, 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 a great resume. Yeah, he was in Dirty Harry, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, just mm-hmm. so much stuff. Um, then Dorothy is played by Ellen Crawford, who was one of the nurses on ER. That was pretty much on the entire show. Um, but yeah, great, great cast, great writing, great scripting. And also, it was a kind of you know, it was, it was obviously a period episode. Mm-hmm. which I always kind of like those because it just it just gives it a more world it, it draws you into a world a little bit like he has the camera it's that like, the one with the, the lens that you have to kind of pull out and it's you know the analog cameras obviously um I, I thought a really cool scene too was when they're going to the elevator and they have the men at work sign mm-hmm. yeah which you which that that doesn't exist for the past like 50 years <laughs> I yeah. thought it was really cool I did wonder and this is me nitpicking again how silent were those cameras? Because he was like five right. feet away from them. <laughs> like, those well, old I cameras mean, have to go click, 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 right? I, I mean, to nip, nitpick too, the other weird thing was um, his, uh, <laughs> a Chalmer, uh, Mrs. Chalmers was blind, but it didn't look like she had a handler or didn't have like a walking stick or anything when she walked out of the, uh, uh, the um, I guess, the lawyer's she, office. She had a guy with her. Did she? Okay. I didn't catch that. Yeah. I was wondering, that's the one thing I was wondering about during the seance is like how they can pull us off with another guy in the room. Like, yeah, did the guy never side. see Madame uh, Leona? Yeah, before? I, I, was little, I was really curious about all that. But again, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, but the whole line, like, she'll never see these. And I was like, oh, what does he mean by that? Like, yeah. I was like, that, that really threw me for a loop. And then they, they kind of revealed that she's blind. I was like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. It's a really, really good script. Um, and the whole song thing actually didn't bother me because like sometimes you hear a song and then like a couple days later mm-hmm. you'll just have it be humming in your head. Yeah. And also you're thinking about it. You're in this. Benjamin was in this closet probably for a couple hours, <laughs> watching his ex lover having sex with this older guy. It, you gotta focus your head. You gotta put your head somewhere. So maybe yeah. he just got the song <laughs> stuck. Like that. That would be great. If there was a shot of him just in the closet, just like, oh my god, get me out of here. He starts humming the song to himself. It, it reminds like, me of. Uh, it reminds me of Wayne's World, where Garth or I forgot what song triggers his memories in the dental office. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I was I was telling my daughter the other day that I've had the Lizzo song about damn time in my head for about a mm-hmm. month. Like yeah. it, it feels like a month. It's probably been two days, but it's been stuck constantly. So yeah, I, I could see you starting to sing something that was stuck in your head. Yeah. Like that. So, so again, yeah. I thought on the writing scale, that was a good way to like mm-hmm. tip off. It wasn't it wasn't really cheap. Like someone dropped something, or like, how would you know that? I mean, we'll get into the comic in a minute, but in the comic, the the con is found out because literally the dude just walks in while they're like, "Ha ha, we're con men. Ah, we're conning him. What a dope." I mean. 
it's pretty cheap. I, I didn't um I really don't know much about Lizzo at all mm-hmm. a- until there's a controversy apparently because she got in some private jet wearing just chaps. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I think it's funny because it was uh, basically like a conservative news source that somebody retweeted to mock them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I never would have even known about this if it wasn't for conservative news, a news yeah. source being upset yeah. about it. So I just thought it was funny because like, who cares? It's fucking 2022. Let people do what they want to do. <laughs> if you want to um, wear just chaps, that's that's our uh, dads from the crib stance. We're yeah. just chaps. It's just and put down the t-shirt. And what I will say <laughs> is, can, can we can we can we just get rid of the term? assless chaps because all chaps are assless <laughs> like by definition chaps don't have an ass i'll, I'll yeah. submit that for approval um but again also i like the fact that you know we had there was a gun pulled in this episode i can't remember there's a knife but like we haven't had we've this is four seasons of tilson Curve. we haven't had an elevator death <laughs> like you know way, way to switch it up i appreciate that and then again the comedy of it kind of coming up and all the blood and stuff falling off I thought that was great. I loved it. Yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. The fact that anyone has ever fallen down an elevator shaft is ridiculous in my head, but it, apparently it happens. It, it was I mean, funny. It used to happen with some regularity. That would be some good trivia, Jody. <laughs> I'm sure it's happened in, in other movies before, but I, I distinctly remember it happening in the TV show Oz, of all things, um, the prison drama by HBO, because like, but you think that was set in the late 90s, early 2000s, that by then, like, elevator, like, Otis or Whoever mm-hmm. else works on elevators mm-hmm. would have figured that shit out by then. I do like when he called the elevator back up in this, that it went up like the bottom of the elevator was like right at eye level, <laughs> you know, just so they could <laughs> see everything. Right. That's a, that's a pretty Such bad a elevator. <laughs> Maybe and, that's and, why they got the uh, the building to be able to put their name on the door because it, the elevator was such a piece of crap that uh, it was a really cheap building. I, th- I think it was in New York when they first started making manual elevators or sorry, um, automatic elevators that um they had contracts set up by the union for the union saying basically that um elevator operators had to stay on for x amount of years because i guess it was going to put like a ton of people out of work if they no no longer need elevator um people so even to this day i think in new york there are places that still have elevator operators oh really (laughs) yeah more more so the high-end buildings where it's like you you can't be bothered to press the button yourself but that's for the health of it um does john (laughs) snars used to have an elevator attendant i don't know all i know is when he went to chicago he flew first class so oh, okay. <laughs> so problem um but yeah overall i this is a very that was a very very good episode yeah great all right jody why don't you talk about the comic okay so uh this was from vault of horror number 25 july 1952 Script and art both by uh, Johnny Craig. So this was kind of a one-man show up until you got to the coloring and inks. But uh, this is one of those episodes where they took the idea and uh, really tweaked it a lot to make it more interesting. Because the con in the original story, it's two guys. And uh, they are conning Chalmers again. And all their con is they're getting him to invest money in a company that doesn't exist. So he comes and gives them a check for a lot of money. And then they just spend it. That's the whole con. It, they, they didn't have to work very hard for that one. Uh, but he did say that uh, when they first started, Ma- Madam Gilda didn't approve. Uh, it's his wife's medium. She, she believes in it. He doesn't. And then one day while they're talking about what a sucker he is, he just, he hears them and walks in and says, you know, I'll call the police on you. So they just, it's so very like cut and dry. There's not a whole lot going on here. Like the con is he gives us money. The uh, reveal is he walks in on them literally saying like, what a sucker. And so they don't want to be caught. So they run his car off the road and actually actively murder him in the comics. So that's a little different. And a few days later, they visit his wife who says she needs to withdraw the money that uh, he had invested but she'll have to ask her husband first. And so they, instead of impersonating Madame Gilda, they pay her off to hold the seance. And they say, you know, here's what's going to happen. We're going to hold this seance and we're going to put, one of us is going to put on this luminescent stage makeup and pretend to be Chalmers. And we'll come out and we'll say, you know, like give him the money or whatever. And then we'll walk off. And so they do the seance And then you see the guy come out glowing. And instead of doing what he's supposed to, he strangles the other guy right there at the table. 
And that's when Madame Gilda is like, hey, that's not what this was all about. Uh, that's not what the plan was. And she actually confesses the whole thing to the wife, says, you know, they paid me off. They were going to do all this. And, you know, I can't believe that he strangled his partner. And let's go catch him. He was right back there. And so they go in the back and he is also strangled. Madame Gilda says, how, how could this happen? There was no one else in the room. And that's it. That's just the end of it. <laughs> so it honestly not the best Tales from the Crypt comic. So uh, when they converted this to the show, I feel like they added a lot of fun to it. They made the story more interesting. I know, you're, I know what you're about to say, Jason. Uh, when they wrote the script, the script writer here uh, did a great job. And he's one of the people I really like. You're right. So uh, yeah, I forgot to mention this, that this was actually written by Harry Anderson um who's mostly known for his acting but i guess he did some writing um he was in the uh, corman's calamity and of course my beloved night court night court i mean he the one of the things he really wrote he wrote some he wrote i think some night court episodes okay. and he wrote that um he wrote some episodes for uh dave's world oh yeah i forgot about dave's world that was a good show too yeah i think after we finish tales we should do a night court podcast <laughs> You know what, man? I, I wouldn't be against that. Like that's what old shows. Uh, <laughs> that or just throwing it out there. One of my favorite comedies of all time, uh, Get Smart. Ooh, that's a good smart. show. Um, I, I think uh, we, we can we can we can get off off there. But even doing random episodes of old, like so, the first episode of Get Smart, uh, I watched it. My like, I got the box set by the way from Time Life, and the box set. <laughs> Time lie, I heard that. Yeah, dude. A minute. This is a long time ago, and the box set opens up like the intro with all the weird gates falling oh, down over him. So, cool. so great! And the first episode, he's sitting in, uh, he's watching an orchestra play, and his his phone goes off, and you get the the the, the laugh from the, the audience. So my, I still remember my daughter going, "His cell phone's going off. Why is that funny?" And I was like, "Because <laughs> in 1965, like no one had it." And then I think it was on like, the second or third episode. He's getting a shoe shine, and his phone rings. He goes, "Hold on a second, let me answer that." And he pulls his shoe off to answer it. I was like, ah, "Ahead of his time." <laughs> All right, uh, Jody, what do you rate this episode? Uh, I really like this one. I'm going to go all the way to 4.5 on this. It, it's a lot of fun. I I enjoyed the whole thing. Performances. The surprising gore that just pops up in the middle of it, the film noir stuff. Like it, it was a great, great episode. Mondo. Oh, two weeks in a row, man. I'm gonna go five. Like I, I thought this is a wonderful episode from start to finish. Uh, the horror elements kind of just just placed in perfectly uh, with the film noir and the wraparound. Man, I, I love the Crypt Keeper with the <laughs> I love the Crypt Keeper with the, in the film noir style. It's, and how cool is it that John Cassier? think about how how much talent this takes that he's doing the crypt keeper voice but then making the crypt keeper voice do another accent yeah I, I that just to me just blows my mind how people can do that like i'm gonna create this other character's voice and have them do something different that's this whole next level for me so i i i love this episode and it gets a five for me mondo what am i gonna choose four I'm going five. <laughs> oh! 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 <laughs> <laughs> No, Have I, I ever been the low score? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Joe. This might be a <laughs> this might be a first. But no, I just beginning to end this episode just kept impressing me. Like again, on paper, you're like eh, it's con men, yada yada, seance, yada yada. But it's just so it, the writing is so good, directing is so good, the acting is so good. It, it it just is up there. Well, you know, I didn't even think about it till um. Like right before we did the episode, after I'd already watched it, um, when I saw the Harry Anderson wrote it, and I'm like, ah, it makes so much sense because, because mm -hmm. again, like even if you go back to Night Court, some of that humor in there was kind of, it, it makes sense, right? The humor from Night Court, the humor in this, uh, and I, I, maybe humor is the wrong word, but the um, the, the little the like nor our sensibility, quirky sensibilities, yeah, that's mm -hmm. like that seems like right up his alley, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and Harry Anderson, outside of all that, he was a magician. That like when I was a kid, yeah. like I was really into him because he he was funny on the shows and he was also a magician. He'd do magic tricks when he was on other stuff. And some of this episode almost felt like a magic trick, like when you get that sudden like the intestines hanging down from the elevator, like it's out of nowhere. It surprises you. It's fun. Like, and that's what this whole episode felt like to me. Just right. I mean, moments I of surprise. I think a good con movie or TV episode, you're, you're, you have to con the audience first. 
Yeah. Well, as, as they're conning the character. So we have, so as long as they're keeping the audience con. So like, again, and it's all about misdirection. Where they're talking about, oh, you're going to get this $3 million. Like, oh, okay, that's interesting. But no, really, they're after the, the 300000 to pay off the other guy. Um, yeah, this all, yeah. This, this episode, was, I thought, was one of the best written episodes I've seen. So very, very high on that. All righty. Um, so now we go to our Al's anecdotes. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, Mondo, do song of the day. All right. So I'm going to go with a band from 1969. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. Um, good year. <laughs> good year. Why? Um, was that... Is that Woodstock? Sadly. It was. Um, it was. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Woodstock. Ultima. Um uh, I'm with a, uh, an American band from that era uh, that goes by the name of Coven. So Coven, oh, um Coven, yeah. Coven is kind of like what's funny is uh, very satanic in imagery and card carrying members of the Church of Satan, which Anton Zander at the time was kind of uh, was pushing in uh, on the West Coast. Um, it's, it's the, the, musically, it's definitely not metal. It's more so like Jefferson Starship if they dabbled in Satanism and, uh, they're there, but they were a band that legitimately practiced the dark arts and practiced magic and practice satanic magic or for what that's worth, like whether you believe it or not irrelevant. Um, it's some interesting stuff, but they actually came out, uh, right before black Sabbath did. And they actually had a member who went by the name Oz Osborne. And the first track on the record, or at least their debut record, was called Black Sabbath. I 100% do not believe that it had any bearing on the band Black Sabbath, because again, this wasn't like it is now, where you just pop open Apple Music or Spotify and hear the new music. Back then, word of mouth had to travel. Um, where were they from? Here, in the States. Okay. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly where. No, if okay. I, well, I saying if it was a British band, then maybe. But yeah. no, no, no. They they were definitely not. An, they were definitely not an English band. And um, it, it was kind of funny because some people, like uh, early music reviewers, called them like the aristocratic or the uh, Black Sabbath, kind of considered the the ruffians, the uh, uh, the street uh, musicians, so very, uh, working class. Yes, working class. Is a good working way to put class it. Areas. Yeah, whereas they kind of called a coven the uh, the aristocratic version of that, even though it really wasn't. But one of the first bands ever to do, to do the goat horns or devil horns, which Ronnie James Dio claimed that he he invented, which he might have. Who knows? Um, rumor is that was an old uh, uh, old um. I hate using the word um because I know nowadays gypsies considered it's kind of a, a slur. Um, but it was an old hand signal from 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 from, from them, and they did uh, upside down crosses on these records where nobody was doing that. Like that was considered commercial suicide. And, uh, but uh, I'm going to pick the song off their debut record, which is called, uh, it's got two names, uh, the name, their name and the name, the record label named it, but it was called witchcraft destroys minds and reaps souls. That's the full name of the record also known as witchcraft. And I think the song is very, very fitting. Uh, the song I'm going to go with off that record is called wicked woman. <laughs> so wicked one by the band coven uh, they did a second album and i mean uh, i forgot like recently a, a label re reissued and i picked up both the records um but the second one is way more like disco pop you can oh, tell yeah. they're trying to go in the way of making more money uh the first album though i think is actually a really really great album and even people like i know i recommend a lot of metal that probably people never listen to it's definitely not a metal album so if you kind of like that 70s jefferson starship style sound uh, uh check it out it's really good music in my opinion what did the label want to call the album well the, the label just called it witchcraft oh okay that was it's good. witchcraft it's kind of like um it's a white zombie when they did their most famous record which is astro creek 2000 mm -hmm. that was a name that was at every record store on mtv but the real name was Astro Creep 2000, Tales of Love, Destruction, and Other Synthetic Delusions of the Electrohead. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna—they're not putting that in a fucking marquee, <laughs> right? Uh, but Jason, I think you would actually do. I hear you typing away on your little mechanical keyboard over there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's something. I think I think it's something you'd actually enjoy. Yeah, well, actually, I was telling you earlier. I've been listening to a lot of Dark Throne. Um, I was playing it. My son likes to listen to. He's kind of into metal a little bit. Uh, especially the punkier um, music. 
he was really liking it until the song Graveyard Slut came on. I was like, oh, <laughs> nope, skip. Oh, so, so he, it's not that he didn't like that song. He was like, you shouldn't listen to this song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is my my seven-year-old, by the way, not, not the uh, 16-year-old. All right, I um, respect that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, no, no, that's no, just, it's, he's, yeah, he soaks up things. Are you, are you, are you, um, are you against and uh, slut's a pretty bad profane word. That's a pretty bad word. They should never be repeating. Are you are you I mean, against are you against him hearing like the word fuck in a song? I'm not, I'm just, I, I, I don't mean a bad one. It depends. Like if it's like a, a one word, like in the in the verse, like he's not going to pick that out. But what if it's the chorus of the song? Gotcha. That makes yeah. sense. That and makes sense. Like, fuck, fuck, fuck. Like you know, like this song's like graveyard <laughs> slut. Graveyards like, like yeah. it's really uh pronounced. I mean, yeah. we're, we're talking about a seven year old, that's the kind of thing that you go and like, Grandma I learned a new song, and then <laughs> yeah, grandma, yeah, exactly. Grandma. Yeah, he would totally, he totally does that. You're like, Oh, I heard it, I heard a new rock and roll, like, say, I heard a new rock and roll song, and then he'll like try to emulate part of it. So, I'm like, and, who and, knows? And, if that's the one that he like picks out, then I know, I don't, I don't, I, you know, in, in modern era, I don't like that word, but for the record, that album did come out in 2006, I think so. It, it, it's 16 years old, and they haven't done another song like that since. Um, I mean, I'm not against the song or the, that language. Yeah, but for my for a child, it, it's oh no, I swear, this, I, I swear, I bought that album on vinyl back in 2006. So if you ever wonder my how long I've been collecting vinyl for, it's been a stupid long time. Which is uh, my other thing I need to tell you: all you fuckers out there that buy vinyl and don't listen to it, fuck all of you. Uh, if you don't listen to it, don't buy it because I want to buy it to listen to. And instead, I have to pay a resale price on this shit because I can't hit F5 on my keyboard as fast as you can, you piece of shit reselling scammer motherfuckers. All right, put the explicit uh, label on this episode. <laughs> I mean, I do every time anyway. It's I just know, a it's chance. <laughs> All right, Jody, you got some trivia for us? Okay, our trivia is once again completely random. We haven't I'll done this in it. a while. All right, so Owning only one guinea pig is illegal in Switzerland because guinea pigs are herd animals and become severely depressed when they're alone. Oh. So they made a law to make sure that you couldn't just buy one by itself. You had to have at least two so they could cuddle. So if one dies, is there like a statute of limitation where you can only have one? I don't know. I haven't got or can they only the sell one. Swiss. Uh, I haven't gone into a deep investigation into Swiss guinea pig we, law, but we need uh, the space lawyer on this. Yeah. Our, our vice president is a Swiss. I'll ask him this tomorrow when I talk to him. <laughs> tomorrow while we're talking, say, hey, heard something about guinea pigs. What do you know about guinea pigs? I know you've lived in Florida the past <laughs> 15 years. What do you know about guinea pigs in Switzerland? All right, so here's our second random piece of trivia. I always love it when countries have like a specific word for some phenomena, mm -hmm. you know? And so the German word... Uh, Kummerspeck is uh, the word for weight gained during emotional eating. It vaguely translates to grief bacon. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I love want it. that on the. That, that's another T-shirt <laughs> or, or a sticker. Grief bacon. Give me that grief bacon. So if, if you're like, well, what's been going on with you, man? You, you know, you you look a little bigger than the last time I saw you. I'm like, it's just been the grief bacon, man. The grief bacon. <laughs> I love it. I've been dealing you, with some stuff. You need to put that in the uh, the Zen channel on Slack. <laughs> All right, and my last one. And this one I pulled out because it made me upset that this is not still a thing. Three Musketeers candy bars. Mm, I love Three Musketeers. They used to have three flavors. The whole point of the Three Musketeers was that it was a Neapolitan thing. Each candy bar contained a strawberry section, a chocolate section, and a vanilla section. What? And it was made to break into three pieces and share <clears throat> among three people to share with your friends. Why do we not get that Three Musketeers version anymore? I want this, that. This is when almost the, as bad as Coke getting rid of cocaine in our fucking soda. <laughs> <laughs> when did this stop? I don't know. I, I don't have a timeline for it. I need to find this out because that's really upsetting to me because now anytime I eat a Three Musketeers bar, I'm going to wish that I had some strawberry in there and some vanilla. I'm a little, I'm a little messed up about this. Right well, now. for the record, this is why Three Musketeers bars are just kind of fucking basic. Like, they're not that great anymore. I know. They, they got rid of the uh, original version. So, 
yeah, I'm, I'm upset about that and I'm not sure I'll ever recover from it. You, you, you know, I just noticed. So I have this portrait of the beyond on my thigh of um, uh, the Eliza. And if I let my thigh hair grow back in, it kind of looks like she has, it kind of looks like she has a mustache. Just saying. <laughs> nice. All right. Bring back the Neapolitan musketeer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. That brings us to our dad advice. Uh, we posted to our Instagram uh, stories looking for people to send us something. And we got a really good one. Uh, Mondo, hit us. So uh, we only got one response. I want to thank you. I want to send a thank you out to vibes underscore Cleveland and a shame on you to everybody else. All 52 of you that saw it and didn't respond. So Um, much shaming this episode. Right? Like shame on you for not listening, for not listening to your vinyl, for not answering our questions. No, no. It's for, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we're basically the Catholic, we're basically the Catholic church today. Uh, (laughs) I mean, we only posted it like a couple hours ago, so. At three, yeah, you're right. You're you're right, Jason. You're right. Like fucking voice of reason over here. Anyhow, it's a great. It is it's a, a great question. It's a it's a great question, and it is, which horror movie dad would you be? So I was thinking about this because I saw I saw earlier, and that's a really hard question because in horror, dads are often antagonists, or often absent, or often you know this. A scary figure i mean but do you like, but would you do you want a hard question or a flaccid question i mean no i no, i like it that's what i'm saying it's a very engaging question I'm, yeah you do you would really like it when about that obviously you want you like it when it's harder you don't want a flaccid question that's weird yeah okay yeah. I, get, I get it okay no. <laughs> um so Mondo, what do you think wait hold on a second you, you can't start answering the question and just give up on it i thought you were answering the question okay um <laughs> so the the uh, the quote the first one that came to my head was uh, the Jack Torrance character. Oh, wait, hold on a second. <laughs> it's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> well, as far as like, you can just relate to like a situation where you're just stuck there with your family. And you're just like, I just want to do my work. I, I'm stuck with my family. I guess I have to kill them. Yet I cannot relate to that. Well, Sorry. I'm saying that vibe. Um, but I thought that'd be a little... <laughs> Not the murder vibe. I'm just saying, they like. <laughs> I mean, it's all part of it, dude. You can't, you can't like cherry pick part of the personality. Yes, I can. Part. It's my show. I can do it. <laughs> but um, I, I decided to go a little more cerebral, and I'm going to go with Dallas from uh, Alien. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really, gl- I'm really glad you weren't stuck on Jack Torrance and his murder of his family. <laughs> I mean, he's not technically a father, but he is kind of the father figure. If like quote mother is the mother, you know the mother computer, and he would be the father, and just the like, just the, he's just so like, oh my god, what the fuck is going on? Just get get what, just do your jobs, guys. Come on, move it along. Get your shoes on. Go potty. <laughs> oh, what you just went potty five minutes ago? Gosh, okay, no one's gonna go take care of this alien. Fine, I'll take the flamethrower. Go <laughs> into the creepy tunnels and just kind of like walk around. Let the alien murder me, just so I can get some rest. <laughs> Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what? Yeah. That, that to me is a dad vibe. Jody, you got one? All right. So like, yeah, like you said, this is hard because there's not a lot of great dads in horror. Like that's making me feel like I, there's something missing here that I need to, to come up with. So I, I've thought of three dads that are not all necessarily great, but you know. So have y'all seen the movie Becky? Yeah. Oh, good yes. One. The dad there does like die for his daughter spoiler but yeah he does he you know he takes some torture and tries to protect his daughter so i'm like that's that's a good dad that's a good horror movie dad mm-hmm. um i thought of the dad from gremlins i thought that too <laughs> he's kind of absent though like he he does his thing and then he just like disappears for the rest of the movie until the very end when and he then, comes back then he also kind of gives his kid he gives his kid gifts. a strange animal questionable guess but okay yeah we've yeah. all done that I'm like okay it's not quite it doesn't quite fit the age on the box but i'm right. sure they'll be fine i mean every time i watch you know something like scream with my 12 year old i'm like okay yeah you know <laughs> making making questionable decisions but ultimately where i landed not because he is a good dad but because he's john fucking saxon 
is I want to be Nancy's dad from Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> oh, damn John it. Saxon's really a cool guy. Well, okay, hold on. I thought the question was which dad do you relate to, or no, which no, dad no. would you be? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know who I relate to. Probably more the dad from Gremlins, but I want to be John Saxon, not that yeah. guy. <laughs> who would no, want to be John Saxon? <laughs> is it who? It's a uh, who would you be? Ooh, oh, so, so I can choose. So I can choose to be John Saxon. Okay. Not, not who am I? Who would just, I be? Well, okay. Is this part I mean, one or part three, John Saxon? Well, I mean, the reality is he's kind of a crappy dad. Like he doesn't believe his daughter. You know, everyone's getting murdered. Like he locks her in the house, and Freddie's like he's not a good dad in that on Elm Street. But by the time um, New Nightmare comes around, okay, John well, Saxon as the as dad as real John Saxon, <laughs> all those things together. Like he's he helps Nancy slash the real person so yeah that john i don't know i just john saxon's a cool guy he's in a lot of jello too <laughs> yeah in bruce lee movies yeah he was in enter the dragon right i don't know mm-hmm. he was he was in enter the dragon that's right <laughs> okay don't leave, don't leave me hanging there <laughs> all right mondo all right i'm just gonna go well now uh, yeah she showed he stole mine because i thought i had a but uh we're gonna go with uh captain elliot spencer who became pinhead <laughs> i just feel like i'd be good at being pinhead like i don't know like, I, like, I... wait but what's in the, in the movie is he a dad yeah yeah because in, in hellraiser 3 that's his daughter that um right am i going crazy with that that's his in hellraiser 3 um uh right. terry farrell that's that's he like the claims that yeah no not the deaf girl the uh the news reporter girl oh i haven't seen that one in a long time it's been a while since i've seen three yeah anyhow i think he that's her dad like okay go for it because <laughs> remember the, remember the end he comes back to real life and kind of like says we're both going to hell and stabs the other hell priest but uh i don't know i'm just gonna say i think i'd be a good hell priest i think i can handle that job pretty well you can like, um it's it's metal as fuck, dude. Like, come on, you get the yeah. whole priest. Or um, but realistically, if I had to say like one dad that I really admire and admire in horror films, and I don't want to mispronounce his name, but it's the uh the dad in Train to Busan. Yeah. Oh, see, there you go. There, yeah, okay. Like, there you go. Um, I I just think like man, like he does everything in that one just to save his just to save his child. And oh, what like, about the uh, what about Winston Duke and us? Oh, that's, that's a oh, okay. That's... Winner. Yeah, that's 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 me. That's a great yes. one too. Yeah, Jody doing can't. Best, sorry, also an idiot. You already said John Saxon, so you do, can't, doing uh, his best, but also an idiot. I, or, I like that combination. Or, or even I was thinking, um, I can't remember his name, but the dad in Insidious. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, like, another. These, these are like all of the dads in these movies don't necessarily succeed, but I, the ones that try, right? Ooh, Craig T. Nelson in Poltergeist. Yeah. Well, oh, 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 wait, no, that's right. He didn't know he was buying a house on Indian Barrel Ground. Is he smoking pot while reading about Ronald Reagan in, in one of the scenes? <laughs> like he he's making his memoir or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Even what about that, the that's uh, a dad from Pet Cemetery? Oof. Yeah, well, he a bad dad yeah. or a good dad? I mean, that's, that's you know bad. what? He, but, but you want to know what, though? It's okay because it, it, I think it's just like the dad in Pet Cemetery. I don't think he was a bad dad. They just highlighted a lot of his flaws for the the purpose of it. Even um another one that's actually a really um I think it's played as a really honest character is the dad from uh, Sinister. Uh, oh, yeah. uh you, you what not you McGregor uh, Ethan Hawke uh, Ethan Hawke yeah. yeah Ethan Hawke because like if I found some weird ass taste in my attic that shows some murders I'm not gonna lie I probably live I probably be in the garage sipping whiskey trying to figure this shit out that's yeah. that's some shit that's some shit I probably do I'm just gonna be honest um. I just don't want my kids to kill me or Bagul to show up because that guy is just mm. a dick. <laughs> Lawnmowers and all that. <laughs> Dude, that lawnmower scene from uh, Sinister, I saw that in the theater oh, in the daylight and that scene still got to me because yeah. I was not expecting that. Like, you know something bad is going to happen, but then something bad really happened. <laughs> it happens real bad, yeah. Or uh, how about the sheriff from Halloween? Sheriff oh, Brackett. Sheriff Brackett. Yeah. Uh-huh. He's just doing his job. He's yeah. He he lost somebody. Um, the uh, the Lance Hendrickson character from Pumpkinhead. 
Uh, yeah, that's right. He doesn't call Pumpkinhead thinking what's going to happen is going to happen. He wants revenge for his poor child. Like the the beginning of Pumpkinhead is yeah, yeah, man. The beginning of Pumpkinhead is kind of heart. It's heartbreaking. He's a good dad at the beginning yeah. of Pumpkinhead. He's taking care yeah. of his kid. Yeah. See, we talked this through now. We're not calls just down, uh, calls oh. down a vengeance team. We, 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 right. we got we got from Jason saying that he was Jack Torrance to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got it. Uh, Chief Brody. Chief Brody. Oh, Jaws. from Jaws. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, okay. I didn't see that too. All we know is if Jason ever plans a family vacation at the Stanley Hotel, we got to intervene because mm. <laughs> this will be evidence in the court case. <laughs> I might so who, be thinking more of like the Homer Simpson, uh, the Shining episode than the actual <laughs> Shining. I think I've seen that episode more than I have. Hold on a second, though. He still tries to kill his family in that episode. He tries, like, you know. No, no beer, tried, no TV, he don't make succeed. Homer something, something. <laughs> As if the Shining knows the Shining because we don't want to get sued. Oh, it's one of the best jokes of all time. It's um, one of the best episodes of Simpsons of all time. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's uh, on Disney Plus. Is it Disney Plus all yeah. Simpsons episodes? Mm-hmm. You can you can watch them just all the treehouse and treehouse of horrors yeah. and yeah. them lying. Ow, I sit my hand on my desk. That sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was showing them to my 16-year-old. Um yeah, we we've watched ago. all those. Yeah, we've watched all those. So good. All right. Anything else before we wrap up? You good uh yeah nothing i can think of all right well that wraps up another episode next week we will be reviewing beauty rest we appreciate everyone for listening we would really appreciate it if you give us a rating or review on spotify and a rating on oh sorry rating a review on itunes and the rating on spotify and with that we thank you for listening to dads from the crypt goodbye <laughs> Follow Dads from the Crypt on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or I will follow you to the grave. (laughs) No, seriously, you really should watch, but be careful what you ask for. You may get it. (laughs) 